Well, welcome everybody to another Monday night Sonar Masterclass. Thanks to Navico, Lawrence, and Simrad. Tonight, we've got a great episode for you guys. We're going to be talking to Northern Territory Barra Specialist Craig Lattimore. Craig, welcome to the show, mate. Oh, thanks for having me. Oh, this is going to be great. I know a lot of our listeners and, and a lot of our viewers love their Barra Monday fishing. So, guys, Craig and I are going to have a bit of a chat just for the next few minutes or so while we get ourselves going, get a few people coming into Facebook or YouTube or the Dr. Lewis website, wherever you're coming from. Uh, what I'd like you to do, guys, of course, is just jump in the chat there let us know that you can hear us okay. Let us know that we appear uh, as we should on the screen. I've actually got an error on my screen, so I'm hoping that on your screen you can see us okay. Uh, it looks like we're streaming okay to YouTube and all that kind of thing, but let us know. So, Stenko, thank you, mate. Uh, Stenko is a regular viewer of the uh, of the master classes, so good to have you aboard, mate. We've got Jason. He's saying it's okay. It's come up on my screen okay now as well. So. Guys, let us know where you're coming in from. Uh, let us know whether you're on YouTube or whether you're on Facebook. Uh, loud and clear, Bruce. Russell, excellent. Good on you, mate. Nick, okay. We've got a bunch of people coming in here. So we're going to start chatting, guys. Uh, by all means, if you've got questions, you know how it goes. If you've watched these masterclasses before, you can ask questions as we go along. Craig's got a bunch of screenshots and photos that are in no uh, particular order. We're just going to bring them up on the screen and have a chat about whatever comes up once we get going. So James, thank you. Jeff, uh, Carolyn, Keith, uh, lots of lots of people coming in. Trevor O'Dare, good on you, Trev, uh, coming in from Newcastle. Uh, Harley, radio check, he says. Uh, not sure what you mean there, Harley. You can hear it okay, hopefully. Uh, I, I can hear uh, Craig and Craig can hear me, so hopefully uh, you guys can hear us. Uh, Eric, Gary, all right, guys. Look, great to have all of you guys coming in from all over the place. Uh, I know that there are lots of guys that they love their barra fishing. Now, Craig, you've been barra fishing for a little while in the NT. Yeah, uh, tell us a little bit about how you got started, mate. You haven't been there for all that long, but you're, no, uh, you're making no. a few waves. I was originally born in Port Macquarie and on the mid north coast of New South Wales, and mm. after a big naval career and um, working on oil rigs, because um, my both my myself and my missus were fly and fly out, we decided we can live wherever we wanted and she was a Darwinite born and bred so yep. I was either rock fishing and beach fishing down in New South Wales or up in the tropical north and catching barra and Spanish mackerel and you know whatever you want really. Yeah, the, rock, the rock fishing and the beach fishing is great but yeah let's face it the, the barra they're one of Australia's iconic species tropical north has so many species going for it so how long have you been in Darwin mate? Uh, probably 11 or 12 years now Mm. But I didn't really get into the barra fishing until probably seven or eight years ago and seriously probably only about five or six years ago. Yep, yep. Because um, I, I did blue water fishing and because, quite, quite frankly, it was a lot easier to catch a, a mackerel or a golden snapper or cold trout yep. um, <laughs> than trying to figure out barra. Because There's always something. If you can get out on the reefs, there's always something biting, so... Yeah. yeah, whereas the barra not always, so they can be a bit tricky sometimes. And my wife hates barra fishing <laughs> because of that reason. <laughs> so, so this is your ploy to get some uh, time for yourself, mate. Is uh, you, 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 <laughs> 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 sorry, mate. Have I given the game away? Look, I won't. Um, I won't spread the secret to more than a couple of hundred thousand people. Don't worry about. It. I'm I'm very quiet and discreet like that. So. So, mate, um, tell us what's going on in the NT at the moment as far as the barra fishing goes because we've come through the other you know, cool months. We've come through the dry season. We're still in the dry season, but we're starting to head now into the build-up. That can be a good time to target the barra there. Oh, it's my favourite time. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, the, about two or three weeks ago, um, I was out fishing with a mate in Bino Harbour, and one of the biggest harbour um, or other than Darwin Harbour, and we woke up one morning and there was build-up clouds and – Pretty much from then, it was yep. um, temperature rose five or six degrees, and you know there's you know ninety percent humidity at eight o'clock in the morning. And, but build up. I, my passion is big, big barren. Yep. Um, it's a lot harder to catch them. Like you don't get the numbers in the build up. Um, well, you, you can if you're an absolute guru and figuring out <laughs> Johnny on the spot. But you know you're you're in a chance for that. 50, 60 pounder if you're in the mm. right spot and you mm. put in the hours. So so build up time, mate, what, what does the fishing look like during the build up as opposed to, I mean, everyone knows about everyone who's a, 
a keen fisher knows about the barra fishing during the runoff but what's what's different with the build-up um it's hotter your um your storms are a lot more vicious they're they call them knock them downs up here mm. they can come in and you know they've gone 100 k's an hour and you know lightning and all that sort of thing you, you, you really don't want to be in them but if you want to fish the build up you, you're going to get one or two like that yeah but um what happens is the the bigger barren Monday and in the little barren the males and the females they get to the, the mouths of the big rivers and you know your coastal rock bars and that um, to breed and that's mm. when they lay their eggs and and on the spring ties they'll they'll push up and and, and when the rains come they get pushed up on the flood plains yeah yeah and, and of course they're, you know, they're those fish that you, you're targeting is um while they're spawning they I, they pretty much don't bite but you you know you, you've got a general idea of where they're going to be yeah yeah and in the lead up to spawning and in the post spawning period of course you know the lead up they're conditioning so they're they're often feeding quite aggressively post spawn yeah. they're recovering so again they're often quite feeding quite aggressively but you had that period when they're in in the throes of passion if you like and, and uh, <laughs> you know, they're, they're too busy to eat so um uh, yeah, it goes a little bit quiet there so so mate you're fishing mostly in darwin harbour and i've spoken to a few people on the podcast that fish darwin harbour and you know i'm told that there's you, you can get some quality barra there but there's a lot of smaller fish there so what are you doing differently if you're getting those bigger the bigger girls there in Darwin Harbour. What, what's your secret? Come on, we're, we're going to press you for a few secrets here tonight, mate. So, <laughs> well, if you're looking you're for, gonna put you under pressure. If you're for me to fish in, in Darwin Harbour, you've come to the wrong bloke. Because, oh, okay. <laughs> but they are there. You, hmm. you often see them, but they are very oh, – they're, they're smart. They don't get that big for nothing, for yep. being dumb fish. Um, most of your fish are around that either 40 to 80 centimetre, 85 yes. centimetre. You will get bigger fish. Um, in Darwin Harbour, I usually um, attack the, the flats, or the big flats, and maybe some the snake drains, and as the water dropping out of the mangroves. And um, you rarely, you don't get the. I don't say you don't get those big fish there. But you, you, you can. It's just quite rare. They've got their own routine. When I was in the Navy years ago, under the lights at um, the Navy base, when you used to be able to get there. Is um used to see meter barra under there, and they'd be knocking off big diamond scar mullet and mm. you know, small queen fish and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe it's just that there's so many you know, 80, 90 centimeter fish, mate, that it's hard for the meters to get a look in on your lures. <laughs> Wish it was that easy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, look, guys. Uh, as I say, for those of you who have been along to some of our master classes before, you kind of know how it goes, but. We're going to be talking about barra fishing. We're going to be talking about sonar. The questions that you ask us, they can be either barra fishing or sonar or both. Um, we're going to focus on how Craig uses his uh, his sonar and uses his electronics to improve his chances of finding that quality barra Monday. So, mate, first of all, do you want to just give us a quick rundown of what sounder you've got on your boat? Yeah, I've got the Lawrence HCS 16 Live. I've also got the 3-in-1 active imaging transducer and a 2D skimmer and also the um, uh, the Link 5 uh, DSC radio um, yeah, linked, into the, linked into the uh, sounder. All connected up. Great. So we've already got some questions starting to come through. So let's see what Brett's got a, a question for us. Or Brent, sorry. Now, Craig, what we'll find is that um, with the longer questions, they don't, the whole thing doesn't come up on the screen. So I'm going to have to read it to you. But... Brent's saying you can find big girls with a sounder easy. Do you reckon it's worth sitting on them all day to catch one, or do you keep an eye on them and find the bite window where you're smacking the ten to fifteen smaller ones? What's your what's your preference there, mate? Um, it, if I'm well, I, I fish in the Top End Barrow series. If I was to come across some big fish, and I'd spend a good hour or two on them, but it, the whole thing about the competition is you need to you need to be getting scoring fish, and I've sat on fish for five days before, and mm. like last year I did a build up trip and we sat on for four and a half days, and we were going to come home a day early because we didn't have a single fish, and the next morning they turned on and we got uh, fifteen fish the next day, like up to ninety eight, and that obviously you can't do that in a comp, so you need to yeah if you're on your own you've got the time I. I prefer to catch bigger fish. 
Yep. Um, I've I fish with other people who get ants in their pants and they just want to <laughs> stuff this. They just, just want to catch something. Yeah, yeah. Not not willing to wait for the big one. They just want to catch something. Yeah. So yeah. I, you, you give them a good period. You, you got your bike windows around your, you know, you change your tides or even at, if you find them at night time, you look at your, your moonrise and fall. That's often um, a bike window for Barramundi, uh, especially in the billabongs. Um yeah, it, it's sort of a thing, a personal thing, if you want to stay on them or not. Yeah, yep. And as you say, you know, if you're fishing in a comp, then it's a little bit different. You've got to, you know, be putting some fish in the boat. Uh, your, your strategy might be a bit different. If you're fishing for yourself, you might have a bit more time. Um, maybe you're going to sit on those big old girls until you get one of them to open its mouth and inhale a lure. So, now, Craig, I'm going to read. We've got another question here, and this one's from Rob Dixon. There, Rob, I apologise. I haven't managed to get this programmed into the system so we can bring the text up on the screen but rob's asking the question that trolling in darwin do you actively search for fish prior to throwing your lures over the side or do you like to cover lots of ground in search of aggregating fish before you start fishing no um i've got to you pretty much um start trolling where you think they are and then you'll look for them and um either you hug your bends or you, you go on your outside bends and even on a run-in tide, it'll do a trial straight at the centre mm. and often you'll find them in the centre waiting for you. Um, but I – and when you find them, you'll do half a dozen laps on them and if you get nothing, you'll check your down scan, make sure you've got the right depth lures on as well and you may change because when you've got – a man a deck hand and we've got two rods each we'll make sure one swimming at two meters one's at three one's at you know four meters different colors and then you can really zone in on what they want and what depth they're they're feeding at mm, mm. Uh, good stuff and um great question uh, rob so uh, rob's obviously here and he's uh, he's picked up the answer to that question so good on you now craig what i'm going to do i'm just going to pull up our um screenshots and you've got a uh, You've got a, a screenshot here to start us off with. Let me just expand that so that we can see it properly. Tell us what we're looking at on the screen there now, mate. Um, I mentioned before I've got a, a 2D skimmer, and that's two reasons I've got that. Is One is in in the tropical north, a lot of your water is really dirty, and you're, you're going along the plane at you know 50 k's an hour in like one and a half metres of water. The, I find the active, the three-in-one active drops in and out of depth and it's something you don't want to happen because when dirty water, 10 metres can be look the same as 20 centimetres with a rock bar behind it. You know? mm. So you really need to keep that depth down. The other thing is I grew up on, when I'm before Barramundi, I was just obviously like a lot of people just using 2D sonar and I got used to knowing what I was looking at. And that there is a um, – I knew they were reef fish and that they're actually golden snapper or finger mark for the Queenslanders. And um, they're all around that 50, 55 centimetre mark. Excellent. All right, mate. I've got a question coming up from Ben O. Webster here, so I'm going to bring that up on the screen. I'll take that screenshot down. So uh, Ben is a regular viewer of our masterclass as well, so good on you for coming along tonight, Ben O. So – how do you tell by using your sounder whether it's a big fish or a medium-sized fish that you're seeing on your screen, mate? Um, it, it comes with time of looking at the sounder and it helps when you're catching fish so you can see what's on the sounder and what comes aboard. Um, you also – what affects the fish size on a sounder can be um, the speed to try on. Like if you're stationary and a fish comes past, it'll look big on the sounder. But it's not necessarily big because it's it actually scans that fish for longer, if that mm. makes sense. Yep. And if you're – like I usually troll when I'm fast trolling, somewhere between 10 and 12 kilometres an hour, which is quite quick for Barra, but you, you'd be surprised how fast you can troll for Barra and, and still get them. Um, and – it's just, if you're, you know, from experience, if you're 
trialing at a constant speed, you can tell the different size of fish from you know your big marks and your, your smaller marks, and you've also got your um your gauge on the on the bottom of your sounder. Like I've set one out to twenty meters either side. I don't have it on auto for that reason that I know if that's I know I miss out on some water coverage doing that, but I can tell that that's a fifty centimeter fish. That's a 80 or 90 centimetre fish, mm. or if that's yep. one, well, I really need to turn around and have a go at because it could be a metre 20. Yep. And, and it's fair to say it also depends on whether the fish passes directly, if you're using your downscan, whether it passes directly under the boat right through the middle of the, that's right. the beam yeah. or whether it's off to the side of the cone as well. So there's a lot of factors at play there, Benno, um, as Craig says. And if you're, if you're trolling along, that fish could have its nose directly into the boat and it could or could it be facing the same way. It's, it's sort of... Um, a little bit of a lucky dip, but it, you know you've got a, a general idea of what sort of size fish you're targeting. Yeah, it's definitely not a perfect science, is it? This uh, this sonar <laughs> interpretation, mate. I'm going to bring up a photo of a of a fish. Tell us about this fella, or this girl, I should say. Um, that was <laughs> last year, actually, and um, uh, I was. Uh, this was the day before the Top End Barrow series in the. The Shady Camp or Chambers Bay, Think Bay areas. That's a, a very well known area to catching really big barra. Every year you'll get meter thirties there and um, thousands of meter salmon and etc. That fish was um, uh, on the Wildman River, and uh, I found it interesting because the previous I've encountered big fish on. When I say big fish. Uh, over a metre 15 on five occasions and three of those occasions um, you hook one or you land one there's a very good chance in that next 20 or 30 minutes you're going to get another one or mm. be in that same ballpark because I, I, I've got a theory that those big fish they don't travel alone they like a lot of fish they, they'll travel in their same um, size class because when we landed that fish, which um, nearly spooled me actually, I had about a metre left on my bait caster <laughs> and I had the boat in full reverse. <laughs> um, the very next trial run, my uh, decky, uh, Rod buckled over and he lost the fish, but he had a hook straight. In. <laughs> he had a, a hook straight in and also one of the, the next ring up was opened up. So mm. it was another size fish of that quality, probably bigger. Yep. yep. And I actually, I actually hooked that um, fish in the backside with one treble and brought it in backwards. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to tell us that, mate. You're supposed to make it sound like it was a, it was a genuine bite. Okay, let's let's Trev uh, O'Dares here, and he's asking, uh, uh, Craig, what screens do you like to run while you're trolling? Um, when I'm out in the mouth of the rivers, I'll have a, um, a chart and just side scan because mm. predominantly you're in somewhere between two and a half metres in, and one metre of water and you will get big fish. I mean, I've caught a metre 19 in 1.2 metres of water and the reason I don't have down scan, well, there's no point because you're, barely, you're trying to keep your lures above the mud, mm. to be honest, and if I'm up in deep water, I'll have the same thing, and every now and then I'll, I just like a, a big side scan on my on my screen. But every now and then I'll I'll switch it to down scan just to see, especially if I'm not getting fish, I'll get the depth of the, those fish and make sure I've got the, the right depth lures going past their nose. Yeah, good stuff. Hope that answers your question, Trevor. If not, you know you can always put another question up. We're happy to to answer them again so craig i'm going to bring up another uh another screenshot here and uh I, i've got to say i think this time you're just showing off mate <laughs> that was the one in um 1.2 meters of water yep. um, yeah it's um and this was 90 minutes after my my pb in 120 and that's the first time that um I, I started feeling that those big fish, they swim together. Mm. Maybe not, you, you won't get a school of 10 or 15 of them, or if you do, you're lucky. But, you know, 
that size fish isn't going to swim with a 70 or 80 because they'd be targeting them as food. Yep. So what's your theory on why they're swimming together, mate? Do you think it's maybe just because, um, you know, those those fish are both in the same area for, for the same reason? There's some food there or is it, you know? I'd that, say so. Yeah. yeah. Because I, I've got a, um, a guide mate who um, told me that he's been at coastal creeks and catching, you know, 60s and 70s, like, and then all of a sudden they go, they quiet. There's no fish there. They're, this is, they're getting mm. fish after every throw. Yep. And they're all these 60s and 70s and 80s, they just stop. And next thing you know, someone hooks up to a metre 20, a metre 30, and that's because they're food. <laughs> yeah, yep. Yep. Okay, so we've got a question coming up here from Jim Cole. He's saying, when you're trolling in shallow water, do you have your lures bumping along the bottom or do you run them just above the bottom? Um, I usually just uh, along the bottom, uh, just above, sorry. Um, it's it, – don't um, – uh, you know, you do both, to be honest, but I prefer just above. Um, what I might do is have one that's – because I run uh, two uh, rods – on my side of the boat when I've got a deck hand, I'll have one probably a foot above the bottom in that shallow water and the other one I might be able to bump the bottom that's in my hand so then I can you know, move your arm up and down and, and and so it hits the bottom and then backs up and then goes again. Mm. Um, but predominantly just above the, of the bottom. Okay. And I guess along a similar line, Benno's asking, well, what size lure did those brutes take? Um, they were actually, I've actually got the exact lure here and excuse the hooks on it because <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I haven't pulled it out of the box for 12 months because this is a build-up lure and yep. it's a, it's a, a Reedy's, um, big ass B52 with my own custom paint job on it because the build-up, a lot of it's, um, dirty water and I've got a, a theory that in that dirty water, it's not necessarily... The colour that gets them, it's the contrast. Like the when that when that lure rolls, it's that black is flashing. It's like yep. in that dirty water, and yep. and that's why I put these like um, sides on it as well for dirty water. That you get that contrast of black flash in in amongst the dirty water, and it triggers yep. them. Yeah, no, that's a really good point, mate. In fact, um, I'm going to go off on my little uh, you know pet rant here about fish vision. Because one of the things as a, as a scientist I know is that when scientists look at the retina of a fish's eye under a microscope, what they find is there's two types of cells that, that they use for detecting light and colour. The, the, the rod cells that detect black and white or they detect light and dark, and then there's the cone cells that detect colour. And what they find in the fish's eyes is that they've got an enormous number of rod cells and quite a small number of cone cells, which means that they pick up contrast extremely strongly. So when you're in dirty water like that, Anything you do that gives you a stark contrast, bars, stripes, spots, whatever it might be, makes it really, really visible to the fish far more than colour does. So some great um, great theories or some great science, I guess, behind your theory, mate. So love it a lot. And well, this, is a, this is another one. This is 20 centimetres long, and this is another one of my dirty water ones. And I actually got um, Colin at Reedy's to get his um, ladies to put some spray paint on it. I said, don't make those stripes pretty, just make them – Thick yep, and, uh, yep. Yep. yep, good stuff, mate. Now, we've got another question come up here from uh, – where are we? So we've got one from Jason Stark who's saying, what are your thoughts on sitting on top of Barra and jigging them up with the, so the sound of down scan and how do you do it properly? Um, I don't do it that often. Um, I personally wouldn't sit directly on it unless they were in a deep snag and then that you had to – you sort of sit above them and then you might let the current take your, your vibe or something into it and then sort of jig it out. Um, I'd prefer to sit below current because predominantly the barra will be sitting nose into a current and then just slowly hop um, your, your, your plastic or your vibe um, into their face like past mm. them. Mm. Okay, great stuff. We've got a second part to um, – where are we? Let me find the uh, – steer my way around the technology here. 
So uh, sorry, Rob, this was the second part of the question that uh, I asked earlier and I didn't get this far before we got distracted. So Rob's other half of his question was, when you're tro trolling for Barra, do you like to troll with the current or do you prefer to troll against it? Um, as a rule, with the current, what happens in the build-up on those big rivers is all those um, big barra will move, you know, one, two, sometimes three kilometres offshore. And at the change of the tide, when the water slows, the sediment will drop out and the water will clear up. And then they'll push in with the run-in tide. And also the greener water will also push in. So you've got that clearer water and the bait will be doing the same thing. So they're obviously chasing the bait. They're not just doing it so they can have a swim. Yep. And, and you'll follow them with the run-in tide. Don't – with against the tide, I've got some spots and I don't know why. It must be the bottom makeup that you get them against the tide. There must be something on the bottom where they can sit in behind that keeps them like out of the current because they're lazy and they're just, anything that comes past them, they'll hit. Um, I don't, I'm not sure why, but I, I'd imagine it's something that's um, – there's some sort of structure down there that stops them from – uh, you know, it keeps them out of the current and mm. they, they can sit there nice and happy until something swims over them. And, but with the runoff and like the running tide, pretty much your whole day, um, you get that running tide, low tide around seven or eight in the morning and you're following up the river for, you know, till three o'clock in the night, wait till it stops. And they move quite fast. They move very fast. Yeah, yeah. And look, I guess the other thing to, to factor in is, you know, if, you, if you're watching a barra or any other fish in, in a river where there's a bit of current, which way do they usually face if they're not swimming? You know, they, they're generally facing into the current. So if you're trolling with the current, you're bringing the lures into the fish, you know, front on, and so they're probably in a better position to take it. If you're trolling against the current, then quite often, unless the fish has, you know, found a little bit of a back eddy or a, a pressure point or something to sit on, then you may be bringing the lure up behind the fish. Um, which usually is going to give you a lower strike rate. So it doesn't that doesn't hold true all the time, but it's a, a good general um, philosophy to, to, to work by, I find. And don't, when you're um, trolling with the current, don't be afraid to go really quick, um, 12, 13, 14 kilometres an hour, mm. put on big lures and I'll have uh, reaction bites and um, if they're feeding. And I was going to say, if you're moving at that kind of speed, you've got a big lure on that's pumping out lots of vibration, it's got lots of contrast, you know, it's going to come into view and out of view very quickly. They don't have time to think about it. So that's probably And they're, chase, they're chasing big mullet, and big mullet no. just don't, don't stand still to get eaten no. either. No. no. Great stuff, mate. Great stuff. All right, look, we've got another question coming through here from, from Kai. <laughs> Kai, maybe not a question. No, this sounds like it might be somebody you know, mate. You're keen for a bit of Leaders Creek uh, build-up action, you <laughs> say. So. Well, just between you and me, Kyle, I reckon October's my October, early November's my months for um, Leaders Creek. <laughs> Small tides, troll, we, troll, we, troll, 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 troll. <laughs> we, we'll, we'll keep that nice and quiet. We won't tell, tell too many people. So, mate, I'm going to bring another uh, another screenshot up. So let's have a look at this one. Tell us what we're seeing on our screen here. So we're right into the sonar now. What's uh, what's this all about? Um. If you can, it's hard to, um, can you bring up the metery screenshot, please? Let me just scroll through that one. No, it's actually a screenshot. A oh, screenshot? Just say when, mate. That's the one, that's the one. Okay. So on the left-hand side there, this is all about um, transducer placement. Um, on the left-hand side there, you can jump on around that six, seven metre mark from the centre. You can actually see rocks there, but they're not that clear. This is when I first put the um, HCS live on my boat. I knew what I was looking back, but I wasn't happy with it. And if you go back to that other screenshot, I've moved that three in one transducer down 10 millimetres. Wow. And look at the difference. Mm, mm. So, if you're not getting good uh, quality pictures from your, your transducer, you move it centimetres, like millimetres, left, right, up, down, and it's all, it's all about noise, noise from the, your hull, your engine. Uh, it's in a happy place where it is now. 
Yeah, turbulent. Well, it's amazing, isn't it? What you know, ten millimeters you say is is all it's uh, all it's changed to get that difference in your picture. So, let's bring another photo up, mate, and see what you've got here. All right, what are we looking at now? All right, they're my um. If you're fishing the Harbour Flats, they're my um go-to stuff. Like that. you got yeah, squidgy mongrels. I don't believe they make them anymore. And I um actually sent a message to. Starlo asking if he had any out the back that he wanted to. He reckons that nah, they've all been snaddled by people that work in there. Uh, I tell you what, mate. If Craig Lattimore rings me up and says, "Have you got a particular lure in your in your shed that you can spare?" My answer is no, because I know that it's a good lure. Sorry, mate. Keep, keep going. So, squidgy mongrels. What else have we got there? Um, you got the key tech, um, little plastics. Basically, these yeah. are my harbour stuff, and they're all around yeah. that three to four. Uh, inch mark because um, predominantly you, you're targeting those um, you know, 50 to 70 centimeter fish. Um, okay. As I said, you, you'll get bigger fish and smaller fish, but and um, but those um, uh, Z Man uh, swimmers they are dynamite on the flats barra, and you can fish in weedless through snags. I, I use those, um, they're there, I think they're the TT um, snakes heads. Um, or the um, owner flashies. Owner flashies are good in a bit of dirty water too. Mm. And you um, have them weedless or you can – what you do is you, you cut the centre out of the, the plastic a little bit so when that fish strikes, that um, hook flies out, you get a much better hook up rate. Okay. Excellent. And we've got another question come up, so I'm going to bring, bring you back up on the screen, Craig. So we've got Kai – Asking if you find schools of big barra uh, that refuse to eat, are you going to persist and wait for tide changes, et cetera, or do you move to find different fish? Um, that's uh, similar to the other question, but it's a good question. And it's, the, um, it's pretty much the million-dollar question, isn't it? It's, um, and how do you make those fish eat? Um, yeah, like I said, if I've got time, I'll sit on it. For a long time, as long as it takes, that they will feed at some stage. It might not be that day, <laughs> and maybe the next day. But and, and you also got to do things like um, usually, if they're not eating, you'll um, move your distance from the boat from from the fish, and you have to do longer casts, and you'll bring your plastics down to like those harbour plastics. Even for ninety centimetre fish, if they're sitting there doing nothing, you put on a three inch plastic. That sort of, and you just slowly, you know, hop that over like ten centimetre hops, so that's lures in its face for longer. I mean, that, and there's also things like um, uh, suspending lures, like your jackals or your your lucky craft pointers. Um, if you can get it down in their face and just let it sit there, they'll often give it a a nudge or you know a half boof to get it out of their face. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but. Um, I'll sit on big fish for a long time more than I'll sit on little fish. Yeah, I was going to say the the key word in that question was big barra. How long are you going to wait for a big barra? Well, if you're like most keen anglers, you're going to wait for as long as it takes because if you know they're there, sooner or later they're going to open their mouths and bite, so you, you'll stick around. But if you don't have time, well, maybe you're going to have to move and find more active fish. But now, Craig, we've got Rob again. Rob's saying, uh, what jig weight range are you using on the flats for the TT jigs? Um, either with – it sort of depends on the wind. If you've, got a, if you've got no wind and it's really good conditions, you go as light as you can. So I, I'd probably use a, a one-eighth um, jig head and um, I'll go to one-sixth and um, pretty much one-sixth is the highest I'll go. If you need to go heavier because of the wind, you're probably not going to catch the fish there anyway because because when you're fishing in 50, 60 centimetres of water, any sort of waves is going to put them off. So, And and you want that slow sink. So, um, But if you're um, fishing drains that are emptying out on a, on a low tide and there's a bit of an edge off the end of them, you get, it's always good to put a, um, a chin sinker on so that... Um, that Plastic is going like straight down, and it'll sit down, and it'll sit down there, and the plastic will be still floating in the thing mm -hmm. in the current. 
and then you yep. skip the hop, and they'll often on the drop. That's when they'll nab it. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. But as as light as you can go. Yep. Another question from Rob. Rob, uh, why the preference for weedless over a standard jig head such as a nitro? I throw a lot of my stuff deep. Um, to say there's a snag five metres in front of me, I'll throw that plastic five metres behind the snag and work up behind it. I'll come over over a log, over part of it, and let, us, let it drop straight down and then bring it up over this one, drop straight down. If you've got an exposed hook, you're going to be tying um, a lot of traces. And if there's fish in there and you want to go in and get your um, jig head back, you'll spook them and they go on, mm. move on mm. to the next tag. And also in the billabongs, I can throw those um, snake heads and uh, owner flashies 20 metres into the the, um, uh, the lily pads and do the same thing. Walk it, crawl it over the lily pad, let it drop straight down, crawl it up over the next one, straight down, Tiger and Barra will be sitting under there and they'll smash it. Just waiting, yeah. And sometimes a, a really good trick is to leave them on the lily pads a little bit. And yeah. just twitch them enough that the lily pad throws out a, a few little ripples. And as soon as that lure plops over the edge, you know, a few seconds later, boom. Tiger, so, do it. Like, like Tiger it. love it. Tiger love it, yeah. Now, we've got a whole bunch of questions coming up, guys. So we, we're going to keep working through them. Uh, if you've put a question up and we haven't answered yet, we're, we're getting through the list. So uh, James, Matt, Brent uh, have, have all asked questions. So let's put James up first and then Brent, because these two questions, mate, are pretty similar. So... Um, we might be able to answer them both at once. So James's first question is, uh, what are your thoughts about catching a meter on the troll compared to catching it via casting? Uh, we all like to cast, or a lot of us like to cast, um, but is one viewed as being more of an accomplishment than the other? And then Brent's asked a similar question. Brent's question is, do you predominantly catch the big girls on the cast or on the troll? So we might address both those questions at once, mate. Straight up. Most of my, all of my big fish have been on the trial. And when I say big fish, a lot meter is in that. Um, the biggest fish I've got on the cast is a nine. And I've got a few high 80s, but um, uh, mostly on the trial. Um, actually, no James. He's, um, I took him um, barrel fishing a couple of runoffs ago. He lost the meter. <laughs> you're, so, you, you, you're not supposed to you're not supposed to embarrass the poor guy on a, on a live stream mate so i'm sorry to hear that james so uh, i hope you've recovered all right mate and the therapy's uh, sorted you it's out and good again. The drag's too tight or too loose the hooks aren't sharp enough. i said mate it's barrel fishing that fish jumped and just shook its head and the lure went flying yeah. through the air <laughs> yeah sometimes they're gonna win unfortunately yeah so, so most of your big fish have come on the – all your big fish have come on the trial. What do you attribute that to, mate? What is it about trolling that gives you a much better chance of hooking a big fish or at least the way you do it? Uh, I wouldn't say it will give you a, a, a better chance. I mean, you know, there's certain times like in the, the small coastal creeks during runoffs on the spring tides, you've got to get in and you can't troll them. You can troll out in the, the front of them, but you're, you're casting and, and you're bit, you know, you're hooking – big fish in like very skinny water and narrow and in 100 pound, 120 pound trace and 80 pound road trying to stop them. Mm. And, but, and a lot of people uh, you know, around Darwin, all they do is cast and, you know, it's a preference. And, you know, if that's what they do and they love it and they're good at it, then that's good on them. And yeah. I just prefer, find that I found um, – trolling a lot easier for me because I'm, I'm a novice. I'm, well, I consider myself a novice. And, and the, the, the way that I found that I could probably learn a river is cover distance on it and find out where they're sitting and what times the um, tides and, you know, times a year and that sort of thing. So that's why I sort of stuck. I'm doing a lot more casting now, especially in harbours. I'll, I'll never troll. And billabongs, I only troll at night. I love when I'm talking to a bloke who's, um, you know, won a, a Barra tournament or two and got a whole bunch of photos of himself with Meter Plus Barra who says, oh, I'm, I'm just a novice and I'm still learning. 
<laughs> Love that, mate. <laughs> I reckon a 20-year guide is still learning every time they go out. Well, and, that, and that's absolutely true. You're right. And and the day we stop learning and the day it becomes too easy, yeah, that's the day you're going to take up lawn bowls and give up fishing because you, you need a challenge. So let's go to a question from Matt Levy. Now, Matt's one of my Team Doc Lures members. So, Matt, thank you for, for joining Team Doc Lures and thank you for coming on tonight. But Matt's asking, uh, how long do you spend looking for fish versus actually fishing on them? Uh, when you're trolling big rivers, um, you'll look as, as long as you have to, to be honest. And and I said, when you find them, you'll work them a bit, you know, different colours, different depths. Um, you might try you know, trolling plastics or, you know, jigging a vibe or something like that. They don't bite and move on. There's always more fish in the river. With uh, flats fishing in the harbour, you got yourself a plan. The tide's going out and it's going to wait for no one. If you've got fish that aren't feeding in an area, you've got to move no matter what. So, you know, you, you might have 30 minutes on the spot and then 20 minutes on the next spot and then, you know, it's, it's very dynamic. Mm. But, mm. yeah. Now, I, I was waiting for this guy to turn up. So we've got uh, John V, extreme armchair angler here. Um, and John says, excellent. He's got all of those lures and he's wondering, mate, what colour squidgy mongrels you're after. But uh, imagine, if you will, a, a gentleman wearing a trench coat and uh, and holding it open saying, what colour lures would you like there? That's because... It's uh, like a drug uh, dealer at the back, is it? John, and, I, and I reckon that's the image that I've got. So <laughs> good on you, good on you, John. So... Um, we've got Wayne Mins asking on what are your thoughts of, on meter uh, meter plus barra on the flats versus meter plus barra out of a dam? How do they compare? Um, well, I've, I, with with dam fish, I, I was taking you talking about the Queensland dams like um, Faust and uh, those, those sort of ones. Um, I I've never really fished them. I did it um, years ago, but uh, for once or twice when I was living in Cairns, uh, but in Tinaru, but you know, I, I had no idea what I was doing, so I didn't get anything. <laughs> and, and you know, I only enjoy what I know, so I, I'd say flats. But you, you see some of those videos of you know the blokes um, ripping those frogs across the surface and the big bow eyes behind it. That'd be exciting, as. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And look, you know, I've done both and, and definitely, you know, dams, dam fishing can, there's definitely exciting styles of fishing in dams. But I guess in general, if you if you compare to meter from a dam compared to a meter on the flats, well, meter in a dam, you know, typically there's a lot of food in a dam and they tend to be, I think, a little bit more sluggish. When they're on the flats, they're there for a reason. They're feeding and, and they tend to be a bit more active. So I think they're a bit easier to catch and probably a bit feistier when they're in the shallow water. But that's not to take anything away from the dams, guys. There's a pretty good fishing we had in the dams as well. So we've got Adrian uh, here, and he's saying, wondering how long you work a lure colour before you change it up. Now, I'm going to leave that one to you, Lats, because I'm not a big fan on colours. I think other things are more important, but I'm curious to see what your thoughts are on uh, on colours for Barra. Well, we're probably not going to get on because I reckon the colours <laughs> are very important <laughs> on Sundays. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'll... Um, if there's a couple of colours here, that if if you wanted to come up to the NT and chase a big barra and your life depended on catching one, you know, 80, 90 metre or whatever, that uh, kryptonite from yeah. Reedy's, it's dynamite. I've caught more barra over 90 on that, that colour than any other colour. Now, hang on, is Brother. it kryptonite or is it dynamite? Uh, kryptonite. Can't, can't be both, yeah. <laughs> All right, it's kryptonite. Yeah, so a really basically kryptonite. a black back, green sides, silver underbelly. And the other one that's sort of come on the market uh, by Rudy's um, in the last couple of years is called Tropical Thunder. And this one, I don't know if you can see it, this is absolutely bashed up. But you can't really... See that photo, uh, the, the lure too well. If you bring up the, um, have you got that photo, Tropical Thunder, Greg? Let me see what I can find for you, mate. 
Oh. It's gone too far. Let me let me go back out and reopen that. That's the one. So if you can look at that, it's um very very similar. It's got a a lot of flash on it and um, silver sides with um, some green markings on it and red underbelly. And I've had days where those two lures um, just catch everything, and the bloke next to me is getting nothing. Until we tie it on, ties one of them on, then he starts getting hits. Whether that's, I've often thought whether it's to do with colour or the position position of the lure, how far it is behind the boat, has got something to do with it, with it as well. Because I, I remember uh, when I took that fellow I mentioned, James, out and his mate, him and his mate were catching all the fish at, to start with. They were on the outsides of the boat. I was in the centre, so they were their lures were a lot shorter than mine. Mine, I throw mine out last, so you know, so there was no tangles in that. And then I realised what was happening the next day, and so I'd put mine out, and then I'd sneakily wind it up so it's shorter than theirs, <laughs> and then I, I started getting this. <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah, but those um in clear water, I'd go for a green. But flash is very important. And I yep. think more so in dirty water, as I mentioned before, I think you need that flash of contrast, like black, white type stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now we've got a heap of questions coming up, mate. So we're going to start rattling through some of these. So let's have a look at this one. What have we got? So we've got kids are asking what speed you generally trial and is it dependent on the lure? Is slower better? So um, you've covered that a couple of times, but let's do it again just to yep. make sure the message is loud and clear. No, I'll, um, yeah, um, when I'm uh, – if I'm fishing the center of the river on a running tide, I know those fish are moving quick. So anything from 10 to 14 kilometres an hour, and, it, you know, I'll vary it. If you move past fish and they do nothing um, – Go faster, go slower. Um, on the bends, if you're doing tight in on a bend, I usually I tend to slow down a bit because those fish are there waiting for something to come past them. And I think sometimes they're not 100% feeding. I think they're just sitting there. Like the ones in the centre, they're chasing fish. They're already feeding, if that makes sense. Um, whether that makes a difference, I don't know, but I generally slow down if I'm going on a tight bend. In snags, you've got to go as slow as possible. You're like, if you, because your lure, you're using a five metre diver and you, you need to be banging that timber, you, your bib needs to hit that timber, and then you don't want any momentum on your boat because you want that uh, lure to back off and rise back up. Mm. And then you go again. So you, you're virtually going at walking pace and less. So what, and, what you what you're saying? Correct me if I'm wrong. But what you're saying is that when you when you're in heavily timbered areas, you're holding the rod out at like 90 degrees to the boat, and when that lure hits a, a bit of timber, you drop the rod back towards the back of the boat, so the lure gets to rise up over, and then you can set the rod back out to the side again. Is that, is that that's right? Pretty, you, that's pretty much it. So yeah, okay. the lure needs to be hitting that timber, and yep. then back out and then hit the timber again back yeah. out okay i mean yeah, i've okay. done fishing trips with i was doing that and i was getting the fish every pass not big fish you know 50 to 60s mm. but a fellow next to me was just swimming above it it didn't get a hit yep yep so important to hit the timber now jim's asked us a question but before i go to jim's question i'm going to get a few people thinking here so i'm going to bring up craig's question and craig's asking in billabongs at night Full new full moon or new moon, which is the better for trolling? Now, Craig, before you answer that, what I'm going to ask our viewers to do, I'm going to take that question down. Now, what I'm going to ask you guys to do is, let, let's see uh, who, who's got an opinion on this. Tell us what you think, full moon or new moon, and then we'll come back and, and see what Lats has got to say about it. So in the meantime, we'll go off to, to Jim Cole's question. Jim's asking, when you're fishing those heavy leaders, what sort of length of lead are you using for your barra? Um, usually about a rod length, so about um, seven foot, um, I think. And it really doesn't. You, you want it longer than a metre if you can because, I mean, if you're 
swapping your fishing all day and you're changing lures and you because I don't use clips I, I tie a loop knot and because it gives a better action on your your lure if you you know you're losing maybe five centimeters every time you change a lure so longer the better but usually about a rod length okay cool uh, so we've got uh, extreme armchair angler back. He's saying, despite the fact that I don't think that Doc doesn't think that colour matters, extreme armchair angler does. So he wants to go back and ask you again, mate. What colour mongrel should he be fishing? Um, there's it was the I forget the name of it. It was the green and white one. That's um, oh, not the Barrow book. Um, I forget the name of it, but it was the, the green and white one, but it was only really light green. Okay, cool. Let me just... And again, and again, I think it's because of that flash, because when it, it flicked its little tail, it was like a white, it looks white underbelly, it used to flash, and the barrel on the face loved it. So there you go, Extreme Arm Triangle. I hope that answers your question. And, uh, and you and I can have a debate over that, that the next time you come through Cairns. So, Craig, uh, overwhelmingly, the, the guys that have put a comment in there about full moon or new moon have said full moon 100%. What's your verdict on that, mate? Trolling, trolling the billabongs, full, full moon or new moon? I've heard people catch them on both. I think it's the – I think – I know with a, a new moon, you want to probably use black lures. So it's dark as possible, and you wouldn't think the barra would pick it up, but I reckon they must see a silhouette from the stars yeah. or something like that, and, and it's enough. Um, the new moon, oh, sorry, the full moon, I'd um, maybe use more natural colours and probably go smaller. And I think someone mentioned there, as the moon rises, that's a hot bit. As soon as that moon rises above the trees that's a, a hot time hot night okay cool it can be all right it can be yes there's always a qualifier with barra isn't there? there's nothing ever <laughs> guaranteed or cast in stone so um craig when you're trolling do you mainly troll hard bodies or you troll big plastics and other things such as vibes um i won't troll vibes um but um mainly hard bodies and uh but in saying that, I've um, heard a lot of uh, talk recently of um, other good barra fishers that are um, trolling big plastics, I mean big plastics, 12, 14-inch plastics at night time and getting big fish in billabongs and, you know, um, in the salt water as well. Yeah, good stuff. Now, mate, we've still got questions coming through, but what I'm going to do is just go back as uh, in your – powerpoints here there's one that jumps out at me let me just see if i can find it in fact i'll bring them up on the screen and find it up on the screen well i you correct me if i'm wrong but mate is that a ladder on your boat is this, yeah, a, is a, this a, a hillbilly uh, fishing expedition what's the what's the story <laughs> here well my um good mate jack put me on this on this and a couple <laughs> of years ago and it is it's a must i i will not fish the flats without it now it is yet what you see up there, you can you know, longer casts. You know, fish on the flats are usually a little bit more skittish. And the longer you can cast and see them earlier, the better chance that you've got the hook in them, I believe. And I, I love it. So it's really about just getting a bit higher above the water, so you've got better visibility, looking down into the water a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. And like, like it's very frustrating if you're not on the ladder. Because you're telling the other fella, you know, you're pointing <laughs> and saying, "There's a fish there. There's a barrow over here." He goes, "Where? Where?" <laughs> it's a point, point. And it, there's a some things I've noticed on the flats is there's a couple of different kinds of barrow. I mean, they're all the same barrow, but there's ones that are sitting at the base of um, mangroves and that. You can put a plastic right on their nose, and they'll come out and hit it. If you've got a barrow that's traveling you put a plastic anywhere within that meter in front of it you'll speak it nine times out of ten it won't always happen sometimes you put it on that nose i'll grab it but with that ladder you can see one coming from 20 meters away and you can throw a cast you know five meters in front of it and then time your plastic coming back 
to cross its path and then you've got a better chance of getting a, a bite out of it. Yeah. It also allows you to pick those Davidson plums that are just a little bit out of reach as you're going <laughs> on the river. So the Green ants nest in the mangroves. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Let's pull up another uh, screenshot, mate. So uh, obviously a, uh, a a bit of action going on here. Tell us what it's all about. Yeah. Um, to the just uh, before I start that, that um the top of that is very noisy. Why is it not noisy? That was a very rough day. That's what that is. That's just um uh, bubbles from white caps and stuff like that. Yep. Yep. But um we were fishing for Spanish mackerel, and um, that's what all those arches are. That's a big bait ball on the bottom. They push that um, bait ball down. Yeah. They weren't yep. big Spaniards. They were, you know, that metre, metre ten mark. Big, big enough to keep you interested, though, mate. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Have we had this one? Uh, no, that that goes with that um, metery screenshot. I saw those two fish, and that was one of That's it. That's one of those fish. That was a metre. Metre two, I think, that fish was. Yeah. There we go. It, it's good to see the fish prior to a strike. It's, um, it's amazing, the technology. Yeah, <laughs> almost unfair, but I can't imagine that anyone really feels sorry about that. So, well, I I spent many hours saying, oh, "There's a fish, there's a fish," and then, in like seven hours later, you're going, "It's just noise." <laughs> <It's> just <laughs> are they fish? Maybe it's a catfish. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So, uh, so let's. Uh, we've got Adam Scott asking how you identify rock bars in a large river system. Um. Um. The, Pretty much stand out uh, quite clearly on the side scans. Um, you can see those from those. Um, Can we bring up uh, that screenshot again, mate? Of the yeah, it wasn't a rock bar, but yeah, you know, it's it's rocks. Let me just Chris. see if I can find it while you're talking. There we go. Yeah, basically, um, see that's hundred percent rock. You can you can see it. It's um, there's all rubbly rock around it and big boulder there, and basically. They're not always fish holding areas, but um, they're a good place to start to. And you often look, there's no fish that I can see in that, no decent fish anyway in in that shot. But they're a good place to um, start to um, uh, at least keep in your memory bank when you go back next time that oh there's a rock bar you know a kilometer up there we have a look. And sometimes you'll just find fish there because uh, 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 bait aggregates around there too. As you say, a good place to start, and it could be that even though there's no fish there now, when you come back on a different tide, you know the water's moving in the opposite direction, or the bait have moved in. There might be a fish the next time you go past. So, yeah. make a note of it. Check it out again later. So, Zdenko is asking uh, what you think about the Mary River system, mate. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I... tell, us about, tell us about the Mary. What is it you love about the Mary? Well, when I first started bar fishing up here, I like I fished. The South Alligator and the next trip I go to the Daly and then I went to uh, Shady Camp and then I go to Leaders Creek and now I was doing okay but there was a lot of donuts there. I still get donuts, everyone gets donuts but you know it's I wasn't learning too much so I thought I'd pick a system and then do lots of trips there and try and learn it and that was the Mary River system so you got uh, in Chambers Bay there um, uh, Sandpan Creek and Tommy Cut Creek. You're launching Sandpan. It's about I think it's about 40, 45 k's to the mouth, and then uh, along the coast, um, Tommy Cut Creek, big runoff um, uh, catchment for the Mary, and and it's, it's coastal little along there as well, coastal creeks. But um, it's um, as I said, it's a place where there is so much food coming out, and there's it's re it's a reason why they've got the largest population of saltwater crops of anywhere in the world it's yep. because there's so much food there and the barra there because there's so much food there mm. and mm. and there'll be times where you can't get through can't get a barra because of the thread fin salmon there's like tons and tons and tons of them like there's a i've got a screenshot there of thread fin salmon if you bring that up there's there's Lovely, like yeah. Let me just bring it up and you tell me which one you want, mate. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one? Yeah. 
and this is uh, every single one of those is a thread fin salmon from uh, somewhere 80 to a meter long bulk length and there's probably about five kilometers of them up this river and there's one if you're on the left hand side halfway down I reckon that's a barra because it's a, a lot solider mark than the others but chances of you getting a hook up on that barra before one of those thread fin grab your lures is um <laughs> it's um it, i know they're a great fish i know the queenslanders love them especially down in brisbane <laughs> but you know when when you've got 30 and then what well, you want's a barra <laughs> and in 35 degree heat <laughs> It's hard work. No, no, I, I want, I want your problem. I got to tell you, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be very happy with that problem. So uh, Zink is asking whether you prefer the fresh side or the salt side. I assume you're talking about where you've got fresh water coming into an estuary here, and so you've got the sort of separate, um, you know, two, two colours and separate water layers, I guess, travelling along. Which side do you prefer? He's probably talking about the Shady Camp Barrage. Is a uh, okay. where you launch at the um, uh, the ramp there. That's um, yep man main barrage that was built to stop the salt ingress up into the um, system above it. Yep. Um, definitely the salt side. I think the bigger fish there, they, they do go up when they're watered up. They will go up into the fresh. I mean, you've got um, Crawberry Billabong above that and you get meter fish out of there on occasion. I haven't, but I've got a 90 there, so uh, they're there. Other people get them. And uh, so, but yeah, definitely the salt side I prefer. But I'm not one of those people who like to fish the barrage. I think standing in knee-deep water is not my cup of tea. <laughs> Stinko also says say hi to Fang for me, so I'm sure that means something to you. <laughs> and, he, oh, and he also confirms that, yes, he was talking about the barrage, so... Uh, we're all good. Mate, let me just bring up another screenshot because uh, there's one here that I've been waiting to bring up because it just really intrigues me. So tell us about what we're seeing here. That's a snake drone and it's in quite deep water. Well, when you're on the flats, you're, um, you're waiting for the, the water to come out of the mangroves. Why that is is because the bait and the barra are because um, they're only fairly small. They're up there in the um, mangroves and the, they're safe up there. Well, I think they're safe up there. They're definitely safer than out on, on a flat. Mm. When the water comes out, um, the obviously the boat and the barra have to come out because there's no water there. And they move into these stack drains and they, they're like a highway for barra uh, to the point where if you're on a flat, and you see snake drains, you'll mark them on your sounder so you know where they are. And on the ladder, you can see them a long way away because there's like a, there's usually quite a bit deeper. You know, when I say a, a lot deeper, maybe 10 to 30 centimetres deep. deep mm. the mm. And the bait and the barra use that as a highway. And this just shows that even in deep water for a, a snake drain, that's nearly four metres, you've got barra sitting in there. And because they, cause they they must be out of the current there, and they're waiting. For, they've probably got prawns or crabs moving along there, picking them off. Yeah, well, it's a bit of structure, isn't it? I mean, if you look at the rest of that flat, it's yeah, you know, the water's reasonably deep, but it, it's reasonably featureless, apart from that one little uh, you know, snake drain that runs through, and that's obviously where things are going to accumulate, where bait's going to move, and, and where fish are going to follow the bait. So, yeah. I, I love that. It's a great screenshot that one. Mate, I'm going to just, um, just have a bit of a scroll through your, your screenshots. We The questions are slowing down. So, guys, if you've got any more questions, now's the time as we start to wrap it up. But I just want to make sure we've had a look at all of your screenshots, mate. So tell me if there's any there that we need to stop for and spend a bit of time on. I think we've seen all of those so far. Uh, that's my PB. And, and, it, was, and it was? How, how long? That was a metre 20, that one. Okay. And that was on that. You can, if you look at that lure, you've got that um, dirty lure, that one I painted with a black top and got stripes mm. on it, if you could see in its mouth. <laughs> but the reason why I like that and that that one 19 I've got is the water is filthy. It's it, it always looks clearer in a photo, but it was actually really dirty. And what um, 
uh, ex guide told me is two things you want is clean water and bait to find barrel, but you don't necessarily have to have them together. And around that bend there, there was a line of really, really dirty water where was, you put a white lure in the water and you've got about two or three centimetres of visibility. Mm. And on the other side of that, there may have been 10 or 15 centimetres of visibility, but there was mullet kicking around the top of it. They, they didn't seem panicked, but they were staying on this line. And so I just went up and down this line, you know, 150 metre trial runs. So it was a pain in the backside, bringing your lures in, turn around, doing that. But yeah, you can see it paid off. Yep. Sometimes you you got to put up with, uh, you know, the th things that aren't so much fun to get the result because that result's a, a pretty good one and that's a lot of fun. But Let's just go through. We've got a couple more questions coming through. So, Lats, what's your preferred colour on the side scans? I'm assuming you're talking about colour palettes here, and do you change that for different situations? I use the colour palette that's on those screenshots. It's um, Most of my friends use a, a, like a, a blue one, and once or twice a year, I'll, if I'm bored, I'll just um, change it to a, um, another colour. And I'll run it and I'll just turn it back to the one that I like. I don't know. It's just not that photo. If you go to the, the, the side scan ones, I think that's what they're talking about, the color palettes. And so, like, a, yeah, that's that, that palette. Yeah. That, I mean, my friends use the blue ones and a few other different colors. But, yeah, as I said, once or twice a year, I'll change it and we'll change it straight back to that. I just, I don't know why I just like it. Maybe superstition. <laughs> <laughs> plenty of that in fishing so uh rob's asking us the million dollar question where do the fish go once they leave the flats he says he spent hours in middle arm side scanning and he struggles to find fish once those flats are drained um well when when you're fishing the flats because you've got a seven meter you, you can have up to a seven meter run out tide and all the flats are at different heights and your drains are at different heights and your snake drains are at different heights, what you do is you get a, um, a plan together. Um, it takes time to work out a plan in a spot, but you'll fish the highest one first and then, you know, gradually work it, you're down to you know, that flat dries, you go to this drain and then that's over and then you go to these snake drains and then you go to another flat. And, but basically they all come out and, you know, and they're there somewhere. They're probably a lot further out than what you think because I know fishing, um, I think fisheries did a thing, they did satellite tagging at Barramundi on the Roper River and they were doing hundreds of kilometres in a day, like these Barramundi with the tide. So you probably find that those Barramundi are moving a lot further away from where you're fishing than what you actually think. Good stuff. This is an interesting question. I'm not sure what it means, but I'm sure you'll understand it, uh, Craig. So how do you deal with the Easter full moon crab run in the Mary system when they're, when they're hard? <laughs> I, know, I know what you're talking about, and I actually had a conversation with um, a fellow by the name of Shane Compain the other day about it. He's a, he wins tournaments up here and he held a lot more knowledgeable than me. He reckons that when the well, what happens is all these crabs come out uh, from the on the runoff and all the barrel want to do is look like, they gorge themselves on the crabs he reckons that unweighted plastics like like a small plastic with no weight just you know, you know wriggle that around like the, on the on the surface i've had another fella say um top surface as well basically the crabs are on the surface so you need something on the surface and it's, um but i've heard many people say that they just can't get a single fish and it's the same in the harbour if those fish are on the jelly prawns those micro prawns i mean you could cast 10 different things at them and you're just wasting your time pretty much <laughs> frustration yeah um, Matt Levy's asking, how do you identify which snake drains are the best? I think we've probably, he's talking about length and depth, so I think you probably kind of covered that in the previous answer, but is there anything else you want to add to that, Bait or Matt, if we haven't covered that, just um, post another question, let us know. you just got to try them because, you know, as the tide's higher, you work your way down and 
will work your way from the um, the deepest part and you work your way up because you don't want, you don't want your boat going over the top of them. So, um, but you just got to go to the one, go to the next one, go to the next one, and you'll find fish. And not all of them will hold fish. Some might have one. You know, it's and then you soon find out which ones on a flat tend to hold more fish than the others. Mm. It's it may not to do like you can have. It may not be to do with um, the depth of the snake drain or the width or the length of it. It may be to do with where it comes from and how much bait and prawns where it's coming down from the top. If that makes sense. Makes sense to me. Let us know, uh, Matt, if that doesn't help you out. And I think we're getting towards the end here, mate. I think we've been through all our screenshots. Might be one left. We're starting to slow down on the questions, guys. So last chance. Uh, Hayden's asking, what's the absolute lightest braid and leader that you'd fish for Big Barra? Um, uh, Big Barra, when you're talking, say, 80 plus, I'd, um, I use 30. If you're going to be in a, um, uh, a, a coastal creek, 50, 60. If you're on the flats, you can go down to... I, I go as light as five pound, but but it they, it says it breaks at seven or eight kilos. So yeah, but it just gives you that opportunity to cast further if those fish are really flighty. Hmm. You know, the further you're away from that fish, the better chance that you're not going to spook it. Okay, so Matt's just clarifying here. He's asking, do you prefer your flats to have deep water access nearby? Uh, well, off, yeah, yeah, I've got, um, because one thing I've noticed on some, not all flats, but some flats, that all the fish are moving one direction um, in the mangroves. They're either moving left to right or right to left, and they're going somewhere, obviously. And I think I know in one spot they head off the flat and into a deeper water, and they're waiting for the running tide until they get back on there. But if you've got a channel next to a flat, it's probably a good chance to have a bit of a, a look around there on near that low tide. Good stuff. All right. So Trevor's asking the question, how do you get a best, the best view of your sounder with sunnies on? Um, <laughs> it helps if you're – because I've got um, prescription and polarised sunnies, but sometimes you've got to – change your head because your screen goes black <laughs> but, or you're going like that. To, <laughs> yeah, but if you're looking straight onto it, it's fine. All right. Uh, Zdenko's asking about whether you've had much luck with live bait. I haven't used live bait for five, 10, 15 years. The only reason I don't, I know it's a good way of catching fish when the fish are shut down and because you can put a live bait and keep it there in front of its nose and it's going to eventually, it may eventually just eat it or try and kill it or something. And um, But I, the reason I don't do it is because in my comps it's lures only. So I want to teach myself how to cope, how to try and get a bite otherwise. Yep, yep. Okay, extreme armchair angler once again. So with the uh, with the crab run issue, have you ever tried using a crank crab in the larger, heavier single hook size? No, um, but I bought one the other day. Because <laughs> <laughs> one of my spots um, in the harbour, we pulled a we had a, a dozen fish sitting on the bottom at low tide, one of those deeper holes, and they were hard to get up. And we trolled one up, and it threw up a heap of crabs. So I haven't tested it out yet, but I'm going to give it a go. But I've heard people using those crab uh, imitations in those in, in the crab run, and they don't do any good. Mm. Well, it's just mm. you, know, you know, it could be any reason. Yep. So Brent's saying uh, thanks. We need more of this in the NT, where it's a bit quiet on info. So Brent, I, I got to tell you, I was looking at some stats for the. Um, ALF podcast the other day. I've had six hundred and fifty thousand downloads of the podcast, and I think it's only a couple of thousand of those downloads have been from the Northern Territory, even though there's been a bunch of Northern Territory stories on there. So what I'll do is I'll put a link up to the, the podcast at the end of this. So if you guys are looking for some information, 
Um, there's a few episodes there that may be of interest to you. So, Adam Scott's asking, do you change your scroll speed on your sound or do you just use auto? Just auto. There's something I've, I'm used to. That's quick and easy, mate. We've answered that one quick, smart. Extreme armchair angler, so most modern sounder screens are polarised at 45 degrees, so the clearest picture is achieved by slightly tilting your head. So you've got to kind of do that velociraptor thing, you know? <laughs> Tip your head to one side or the other. Guys, it looks like that's kind of the end of our question. So I'm just going to type in a, a link there to the, the podcast for those who want to find out a little bit more about that. I know, here we go. There's another question coming up. So Michael Brandt's asking, what are your thoughts on fishing man-made rock walls? Yeah, well, they're, um, they're structure. Um, eventually, after the you know, after they put it being put in for a while, they're going to hold boat. Fish are going to move along them. It's um, definitely a uh, a point where you um, should be targeting barramundi for sure. Yeah, good stuff. I mean, anything that's any structure is going to hold fish at times, isn't it? So, you know, if if it's not holding fish, then move on to the next bit of structure. But yeah, they all they all hold fish at various times. So. I've just put up the link to the podcast there. Uh, Jason Cottrell's asking about rattles. Oh, <laughs> that's not the right one. We can, what's that one say? So, Brent, when it comes to the in-depth questions, people people shit down, okay? Uh, let me just scroll through here. So, Jason had a question about rattles. So, loud rattle lures, what do you think? Any situation where you'd use a loud rattling lure? Um. I know most of the, all, all the Reedy's range have got a, a rattle in it. They're not as loud as the, the classic um, range, but um, they seem to work. Uh, I, the thing I would say is you need not so much, because rattle seems to be the norm, you also need ones that are silent. So, yeah, that's really right. <laughs> <laughs> you, you need having some... Timber ones in your armory is a, a good thing um, every now and then, especially on billabongs. I find that um, a silent one, like a, a timber lure, or even the, um, I haven't used the raptor lures that they've just started making up in the NT um, not long ago, but they catch big barra there, a um, plastic mold um, mm. type of one, but um, no rattle, and they work really, really well. Yeah. The, yep. the timber lures I, I use a, um, uh, Deep River Lures, uh, Barney, I think he lives in Armadale, and um, uh, Mark Andrews, Mark A. Lures, um, really quality stuff. And they're barra ready, but, you know, heavy rings, hooks, full wire through. Good stuff. Now, mate, I've got questions starting to stream in again, so these guys don't want you to go home. They're, they're pretty keen to milk you for as much info as they can get, so... <laughs> Benno's saying, uh, favourite tides or moon? It's been a great chat tonight. Thank you, Benno. We've enjoyed bringing it to you and enjoyed your company. So what are your favourite tides and moons, mate, for, for barra fishing? Um, predominantly in the build-up, I'll um, have the smallest tides possible because your water clarity is a lot dirtier and you need those smaller movements to get a little bit of green in the water and you target your, your tide changes where the sediment drops out and you get a little bit more clarity. In saying that, like I said, those, they, um, those my two biggest fish, uh, well, filthy water. But predominantly, like rule of thumb, you'll need a bit of cleaner water. In spring tides, and, and especially with runoff, because the spring tides work really well, but you've got the runoff as well, which pushes the, the clean the clean water or the dirty water out to sea you know, and it mixes up with it like your, your tannin and your your dirty water but yeah because i don't know it's um you can use both it's just different spots are better on small tires some spots are better on big tires sometimes you need big tires to create the eddies to get the bait in there and you know you go back on small tires it just doesn't work because there's no eddy. Yep. Yep. Uh, so Rob's saying if you ask any more questions, it's going to sound like Tony Barber from Sailor of the Century. So, um, Rob, that's fine, mate. We uh, we love questions, so keep asking them. We, we're quite happy for your best Tony Barber impersonation as well, so that's all good. So, Stinko, uh, do you follow the tide in and out of a system to find fish? Definitely, yeah. 
um, as I said, those um, those barra, they, they, they'll start, uh, you know, well outside the mouth of the big river. And then you, I, last year in the Top End Barra Series in uh, the Shady Camp, I would have trolled, I don't know, 40 k's in a day. That's in one direction. I, was, I probably did about 80 k's on the boat, but, yeah, but following the tide up, fish will go up. They're chasing the mullet. They don't want to swim against the tide. Barra don't do that. Excellent. Last question, mate. We're going to wrap it up. So once again, Zdenko, what is the largest lure size you use for barra, mate? Um, the biggest one I've got that I've caught a lot of fish on is that um, Reedy's uh, Big Ass 200s. Um, I mean, I've caught 40 centimetre barra on those lures in the centre of the river trolling at 14 kilometres an hour. You know, it's, it's how aggressive they are. They yeah, size really doesn't matter. If they want to eat, I'll, I'll eat. Excellent stuff. Mate, I think you've done really, really well. We've worn everybody out. We've got no more questions coming through. It's been a really great session. You've shared a ton of great information with us. We really appreciate that you've come along. And I know it's a, it's a tricky thing. You've got a, a few guys that are helping you to, to learn the ropes on Barra. And, and, of course, you know, they've – built up a lot of information over a lot of years and so you want to share some of that but you also have to be respectful of where that information's come from and that uh, maybe some of it's not to be shared so i think you've managed to get that balance just right mate so we appreciate that so i'm going to let you go now thanks so much for coming along and uh we look forward to uh catching up with you another time mate i'd really like to get you on the podcast at some stage so if you're up for that give me a yell and uh, we can perhaps get a bit more info for those NT anglers that are after a little bit more on the on the barra stuff from that. So once again, mate, thank you very much. No worries. And thank you guys for, for tuning in. We'll have another um, live uh, Sonar Masterclass, of course, in two weeks' time. Not sure yet who the guest will be, but stay tuned on my Facebook page. Stay tuned on Navico and Simrad's Facebook pages as well. And, of course, on the Doc Lures website, you'll find that we're live streaming now to the website as well. So lots of different places you can check in and see what's coming up next. If you're on my email list, I'll flick you out an email as well. But there will be a great session coming up in two weeks. I've got a whole line of uh, guests. I'm not sure who's going to be next as all. So I will keep you up to date closer to the time. So thank you, everybody, for a great session. Thank you for some great questions. Tight lines to everyone. And we look forward to talking to you all again soon. Bye for now.